All right, guys, so our social spotlight this week is BOSU plus Pilates equals bullshit bodies. Uh, just because you add a BOSU ball to something doesn't mean it's functional. Just because you compound movements together doesn't mean that it's more beneficial. And at the end of the day, you have to ask everybody when they create an exercise or a performing exercise, what is your goal? What I would challenge everybody is, if you're designing programs for an athlete or you're trying to train yourself, what is the goal of that movement? If it's how you look, go for it. If it's how you move, things like this aren't always the smartest. These are our lumbar extensions. This is a great drill to work on if we're experiencing low back pain. So Sloan's gonna go ahead and lay all the way down her stomach, hands under her shoulders. We're gonna try to keep the lower body relaxed and we're just gonna have her press straight up in elbow extension. And these are pretty quick. We're gonna have her do another rep here. So things to watch for, we wanna make sure she's keeping her glutes and her hamstrings relaxed. Sometimes when we're in pain, we're gonna contract those to try to brace. Um, the other thing is there may be some discomfort or pain, but this should get better as we go. Now let's say it's too uncomfortable, or there's too much pain. We can have her simply come up into a sphinx prop. And instead of going through active range of motion, we can just have her hang here and work on some deep belly breathing. And hopefully after that, we can have her work back through another rep of lumbar extension once we've kind of warmed things up. So let's just start throwing out some stats. Uh, the US spent last year around $3.2 trillion on healthcare. Uh, 115 Americans die every day from opioid abuse. That's a scary number. Every day, 115. 80% of heroin addicts started with prescription medication. Right? So the gateway drug may not even be our gateway drugs, right? Marijuana got demonized for decades of being this uh, gateway drug. And it's kind of funny how things are switching now and we're seeing a lot of research come down the pipeline on uh, cannabis and medical marijuana. And then a lot of the things that we've relied on for decades as our pain relievers that have been prescribed by medical physicians in private practice and in hospitals for years are actually becoming the gateway drug. 38% of Americans are obese, right? What may be surprising is that the adult obesity rate is actually a little lower now than the childhood obesity rate. Uh, childhood or uh, basically adolescent diabetes is running rampant. Uh, all these things are just crazy. And what, what's even crazier to me is that uh, with all of these, the healthcare crisis, which it goes hand in hand, is health insurance uh, costs just continue to rise as well. So we have people getting sicker that need more care and it makes sense that it's going to cost more then because that's just capitalism at its best. But now the people that really need it can't even afford it, which means other people have to pay for it and we're just in this vicious cycle of, uh, it's a downward spiral. Approximately 6.3 million US children have been diagnosed with ADHD. And that's as of this year. 62% of those are medicated. You know, anything from Adderall to Ritalin to, you know, sometimes antidepressants. So if we're looking at something like an opioid epidemic, which is running rampant, and how we may be just conditioning kids at a young age to rely on medication to fix things, if we want to call it that, um, we may want to start to question the system, um, not all of these, these pathologies or these diagnoses. Around 65% of Americans are, are on antidepressants. So that means we have a lot of people out there that are relying on antidepressants. There's a lot, also a lot of off-label use of antidepressants and um, antipsychotics and tranquilizers for uh, basically recreational use, which is a whole other topic, which is probably another gateway into the uh, opioid uh, field, which then can go into more illicit drug use like we talked about earlier. Uh, Americans sit on average for 11 hours a day. This used to be not only completely flipped, it probably meant that we were only sedentary for probably one to two hours a day besides sleep, right? And that was usually, I'm talking hundreds of years ago, if not thousands of years ago, that sedentary time was usually community time. The sedentary lifestyle now of most Americans is spent on an electronic device. So we're removing the social aspect or it was spent in food preparation, which is also going downhill. Uh, overuse injuries compromise half of the 2 million youth sports injuries each year. We're basically pushing our kids through the sports grinder. That means that kids are doing far too much too often and repetitively. It's just insane to think that kids are specialists at a young age or that kids need to, we were talking about this with a friend yesterday, that kids need to have a thing. No, they're a kid. And they need to be a kid for far longer than we even think because they need to develop creativity, imagination, movement patterns. And the last stat I wanna bring up here is 
there are around 300,000 deaths that are attributed to sitting disease each year, right? We are becoming so sedentary that things like hypercholesterolemia and high blood pressure and diabetes and vascular disease, whatever it is, these things are running rampant simply because we're becoming more lazy. We are a service-based economy now, but to say that we can't offset that through uh, proper movement, proper nutrition, um, proper sleep, uh, all these things are vitally important, and that brings me into the mission of this show. The mission is to disrupt the healthcare industry by telling the truth, but it's not just that, it's telling the truth better than a lie. So I wanna provide a provocative show that helps people kind of think about the healthcare industry differently because I think change is only gonna be made one person at a time. I mean, whoever's on the other side of this camera can have a mass effect by questioning their healthcare practitioner, taking responsibility for their own health. But really the responsibility comes down to you as an individual to educate yourself, question, and constantly be using some sort of a filter. You are the only one that is your personal advocate. Even though you may go to some people that are top notch and hopefully on this show I can bring other physicians, healthcare practitioners, coaches, and show you that there are people out there that are trying to create really um, intentional and beneficial filters of information. It used to be, I'm gonna go to my doctor and do what they said. That wasn't information based, that was basically directive. Now you have to take the information and decide, do I take this medication? Do I do what my doctor told me? And the only way you can do that is to edu educate yourself. And I really hope that this show helps educate you on your healthcare, the healthcare industry on, at large. And you know, if you're lucky enough to be one of our viewer Q&As, maybe we'll answer one of your questions specifically. So each week, I will be bringing to the table a viewer Q&A, a guest, or she's behind the camera right now, we'll have a segment called The Beards. We're not saying that we're a perfect example by any means, and sometimes we fall out of line with that. And I think if we didn't, we wouldn't have as much ammo to know that we are falling offline. But I want you to realize, I'm not trying to use Sloan and I as a, a perfect example, I'm trying to use it, us as a failing example, right? We fail a little bit every day, but that also makes us better. Now, this week we do have our first viewer Q&A. I want you to send me a video so you can be featured on this show. Um, and if you're gonna send those videos, send them to drbobeard at gmail.com. This week's is a Facebook message and he said, hey doc, hope, hope all is well. Do you have a go-to video for someone who is trying to go to more of a toe running form from a heel strike? Thanks for your help. I don't think I'm a, an elite runner by any means. I think I have a passion for running and trail running and mechanics and healthcare and movement. And that's led me into a uh, a neat little package of information based on running. What is good advice for somebody transitioning to mo more toe running from heel strike? If you listen to my previous videos, you know I'd say don't do it. All research shows that uh, if you're running faster than, or sorry, if you're running slower than a six minute and 20 second mile, that you should actually be a midfoot to heel striker, right? So if I'm running an eight minute mile and I try to transition into a four foot or uh, midfoot strike, my prevalence of injury actually goes up. We want to coach people on getting their foot under their center of mass as soon as they can. So if I land with my foot out in front, right, or I try to kind of stretch my stride out, that's basically going to put my lower leg at what we call a negative shin angle. So if the microphone is my foot and this is my shin and I'm moving this way and I reach too far and I'm in this angle, that's going to create a lot of impact going up my tibia and up my leg. And then it also makes me basically chew up my, the back of my leg, my Achilles, my calf, my plantar fascia, because I'm kind of going in and out of ankle motion super fast. The other thing is when I have my foot far out in front of my center of gravity, like I said, the, the amount of impact goes from somewhere from what is a typical amount of impact is around four times body weight coming back up through your body when you're running to around almost eight times. So that's a lot of force being driven up through the musculoskeletal system. My quick tip is, if you're working with runners or you're a runner yourself, we wanna look to see where is the foot landing as far as center of gravity. Center of gravity is usually going to be looked at as a runner where the, basically your trochanter or your hip is, not where your ear is because we could be running with the head in a, a poor position to start with. Um, after that, we would wanna look at cadence, right? So if I'm getting the foot under, do I have a, a fairly quick cadence so I'm actually offloading some of those impact forces and which again the more time we spend on each foot we see 
injury rate goes up. The third thing would be, can I actually create a good pull with my hamstring? So I, do I see a pretty good angle of flexion in the knee as my leg passes back behind me, or is that leg fairly straight? Jason, I hope that answers your question. Uh, I appreciate you guys watching the first episode of True Health, and we'll see you guys next time.